today. And uh, he has been uh, doing a lot of researches all over the world. He has written over 100 journals. Uh, I, don't, I, I cannot even keep track on what he is doing because he has been doing so many, so many of these researches. And I just uh, was happy because uh, one day when I talked to him, he said he is very busy. But I would like to really thank him for giving uh, us this opportunity of uh, being here in our uh, Zoom meeting. And uh, just to give you a very short introduction, because he gave me a very long uh, list of uh, accomplishments that I could not even keep track on. So uh, nonetheless, uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Kevin Chang. He is an MD, he is a PhD. He's uh, an RMSK, CIPS, uh, ASRA, PMUC, and uh, as I had mentioned earlier, he has been actively involved in research in ultrasound. And if you try to uh, Google his name, you can see all the studies that uh, he has uh, written, both the original research, the systematic review, and so many other things. So we are really privileged to have him today in spite of his busy schedule. And uh, he was also promoted just this month to, um, uh, how do you call it, Kevin? Uh, clinical Associate, Associate Professor. Professor, yeah. yes. Clinical Associate Professor. It's uh, one notch higher than his previous uh, rank. And so uh, at a very young age, uh, uh, you are uh, 25, uh, Kevin, right? Oh. 25, 25. Already 40. 40. Oh, 40. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, he has achieved so many things, so we're so glad that he has accepted our invitation to uh, give us a lecture this morning. But before we begin, as we all do it, we will still, we will just pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, O oh God, for good health, for strength, and for, for preserving our lives, for giving us the opportunity, Lord, to learn despite all these challenges that we are seeing around, we are struggling and yet you have preserved us. You have given us all this grace and life that we all enjoy every day. So we would like Lord, to pray, especially for all of us in different parts of the world, that that will take care of us, preserve us, and be with the frontliners who are taking care of patients. And can we pray for all the doctors around the world to our own in wisdom and understanding from Bob, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Dr. Kevin Chang, okay. our lecturer today, welcome okay. and it's now your turn. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, my dear friends and Dr. Kevin. And uh, I'm uh, very privileged to give the talk. Actually, uh, it's a uh, uh, my first talk in English in 2020, and uh, you know it's a uh, quite unusual uh, in my in the uh, compared to my life uh, uh, past uh, in the past three years. Uh, so I think you know <laughs> our all schedules uh, are affected by coronavirus. But uh, I'm glad today I can see all my great friends and uh, share my experience uh, in uh, muscular skeletal ultrasound. And uh, today we are going to talk about ultrasound for muscular skeletal disorders and uh, due to our experience uh, in other joints. So there are uh, some benefits of uh, ultrasound uh, in muscular skeletal disorder. So including uh, it has a good resolution to the superficial structure. And uh, due to the advance of uh, high frequency transducer, we can even see many small nerves and uh, uh, the fascicles inside the small nerve. And uh, uh, the, another benefit of ultrasound is it can help us to access, assess uh, vascularity. Because uh, if you want to use, uh, for example, use uh, MRI to assess uh, vascularity, you need to inject uh, the 
a contrast agent into their vessel to enhance the, the vascularity. But actually there are several kinds of uh, modes that can uh, detect vascularity uh, very sensitively by using ultrasound. And uh, so uh, you can uh, real time assess uh, vascularity and uh, know uh, whether the, the tissue or target is uh, in front or not. And another benefit is uh, allow uh, dynamic examination. And we know uh, when we, uh, when the patient come to your clinic, sometimes they may complain of uh, the pain uh, uh, may, uh, may be uh, elicited when the patient do a certain movement. But if you use uh, ultrasound to exam, you may find, initially you may find that there is no pathology uh, at the static uh, condition. But when you use a dynamic ultrasound, you are going to find uh, something wrong. And another benefit is can help us to guide uh, intervention. I think uh, it's uh, very important because uh, if you want to achieve successful treatment, uh, there are two main points. One is you have to diagnose uh, the pathology in the correct way. And then the other is uh, we have to, once you know uh, the correct diagnosis, you have to lead your medication to the right place. And with uh, ultrasound, at least we are going to know uh, the medication has already arrived where it should be. But there are some ben uh, disadvantage of ultrasound. Uh, the first is uh, if you want to use ultrasound to visualize uh, the deep structure, the image quality is usually not as good as, uh, as when you uh, visualize the superficial structure. So that's why the very important thing is uh, when, if you want to use uh, ultrasound to uh, diagnose a pathology at the deeper region, you ne need to know its limitation. And another important uh, thing is uh, ultrasound is operator dependent. And if you are not familiar with uh, sonal anatomy, you may misrecognize uh, the, uh, the, the uh, normal structure as pathology. So that's why um, in our, um, during our uh, past, uh, uh, past uh, few years, actually I spent a lot of time in investigation uh, for what we call normal sonal anatomy of a certain area. So uh, for the shoulder joint, we know ultrasound is a very uh, useful image tool to help us evaluate patients with uh, shoulder pathology. So what are common uh, shoulder pathology? So in the bicep, uh, we can uh, visualize a patient with effusion or um, uh, swelling of the bicep tendon. We call it, uh, we may think the patient has a bicep tendinopathy. And then we, if we find a, a visual lean or a, a gap inside the bicep tendon, we may think the patient has a bicep tendon tear. And then we, if we find that the bicep tendon is not at uh, the bicep roof, we may think uh, the patient has a, a bicep uh, dislocation. So uh, for rotator cuff, we may check whether the rotator cuff is intact or not, or whether it has a tendinopathy or a calcification or tear inside the rotator cuff. And uh, another structure, important structure is uh, subacromian bursa because subacromian bursa uh, provides the cushion between the deltoid uh, and uh, uh, the uh, humerus. So that's why it can help us to uh, rest the shoulder in a smooth way. And uh, another is uh, a chromium clavicular joint. And uh, uh, in some patients, they may have a synovitis arthritis, and if the patient has a previous trauma, uh, the AC joint may be uh, unstable and uh, cause the secondary impingement of the shoulder. So uh, this is a case who complained of a shoulder pain, and uh, this case is very young. He is uh, a junior doctor in my hospital. 
As you can see, the left side, this is the bicep tendon, this is the greater tuberosity, this is the laser tuberosity. It looks quite normal, and uh, this is the subscapularis. You only see a hyperechoic plaque at the insertion of the subscapularis. So, uh, if, when you see this picture at the first time, you may think the patient is normal, completely normal. But as you visualize, this is the greater tuberosity. You can find that it seems there is a higher, uh, there is a high echogenic substance underneath the bony cortex. When you see this, you remember to compare with the other side. Because you, if you compare with the other side, you know there is no echogenic substance inside. So sometimes in a flat bone, you can see the structure because of, we call it a mirror image artifact. But in this case, it's not like mirror image artifact because at the contralateral side, you do not see it. So when you see it, you have to suspect the patient have some problem. So that's why we turn on a Doppler, okay? Turn on a Doppler to see what happened to this area. When we turn on a Doppler, we can find there is a significantly increased vascularity underneath the bony cortex. So when we turn on it, you can see, you can see uh, echogenic substance through the small gap uh, on the bony cortex. You know, it must be something wrong. So when I uh, saw that, I prescribed an X-ray uh, um, examination for that patient. And then we surprised to find uh, the cortex over the great tuberosity had been eroded. So you can see a significant erosion of the great tuberosity. <clears throat> and uh, of course, we arrange MRI for this patient. You can see a big tumor here. So the tumor is uh, the giant cell tumor of the humerus. And the reason why can, you can see echogenic substance underneath uh, the bone is because this kind of tumor is a fast growing tumor. So it's going to expand the bony cortex and then you, it will create several gap on the bony cortex. So that's why your ultrasound can see some abnormal signals underneath the bony cortex. So this case actually educates us. If you encounter a young patient and the patient does not have a previous trauma or a history of a sports, you have to think uh, the, <clears throat> the cause of the pain may be, uh, may be from malignancy, just like this case. So this is another case. It's uh, like um, our, you know, our patients commonly <coughs> presented in our clinic. The patient complained of posterior shoulder pain and uh, the doctor in, uh, in local clinic think the patient uh, might have uh, some kind of like uh, TS minus brain, uh, infraspinatus uh, muscle sprain. So uh, the patients receive um, physical therapy for, for half a year. But unfortunately, the pain um, become uh, worse and worse. So the patients uh, visit our clinic. So in our uh, physical examination, we found um, when we palpate uh, her posterior shoulder, we find a very painful point. So that's why we use ultrasound to exam. And uh, when we exam, we find there was a tumor emerging uh, from the under surface of the TS minor and the, the tumor is hypervascular. So if you are familiar with uh, sonal anatomy, you are going to know uh, the area underneath the TS minor is the, strut, is the space, we call it a quadrilateral space. So this is the MRI. Yeah, you can find that the tumor is uh, underneath the deltoids and uh, on top of the humerus. And uh, this is the, the area we call the quadri quadrilateral space. So quadrilateral space is bordered by the humerus laterally and the TS minor uh, cranially and the tricep long head medially. And uh, 
if you are familiar with the sono anatomy or anatomy of the posterior shoulder, you are going to know which uh, structure goes through this area. There are two structures. One is the SL nerve, the other is the uh, posterior humor circumflex artery. So uh, at that time, we thought uh, the tumor was related to both structure. So the answer of this tumor is the SL shoulder nerve. So this, sto this story uh, actually um, emphasizes the importance of som sonal anatomy. So if you have no um, uh, no idea that uh, there will be some nerve cause in this area, probably you won't make uh, the correct diagnosis. And uh, uh, also um, last year we had an article published in American Journal of uh, Physical Medicine and Rehab. In this article, we introduced uh, several uh, important physical examination of our shoulder. And uh, but, uh, uh, in this article, we emphasize we can use ultrasound as an extension of uh, the physical examination. And uh, it can help us to make sure whether our diagnosis is correct or not. Or not. And uh, you can also use uh, as an extension of the physical examination. For example, if the patient uh, have a pain over the posterior shoulder and the, the patient complain of pain uh, when he tried to uh, like pitch, pitch in uh, a baseball, uh, you can use ultrasound to simulate uh, the posture and the action when the patient tried to uh, uh, throw the ball. And then you can put your uh, transducer just like uh, this to check whether the posterior labor is impinged when the patient tried to um, uh, do uh, the posture of uh, throwing uh, the ball. So if you are interested in how uh, you can connect uh, ultrasound with the physical examination, you are welcome to download this article uh, uh, to read. And uh, uh, this uh, is uh, a common uh, dynamic test that we perform for patients with uh, symptoms like shoulder impingement syndrome. We are going to let them to rest the shoulder and watch uh, the movement between the humerus and the acromion uh, during this movement. And in this case, the patient complained of pain when he tried to rest the shoulder. And then you can find when he raised the shoulder, part of the subdeltoid bursa will be uh, squeezed into underneath uh, the acromion. But when he tried to lower down the shoulder, part of the bursa will be squeezed out. And then that's the moment when patient feel pain. So in this case, what are you going to do? Uh, for, of course, we perform an ultrasound guided injection to decrease the thickening of the bursa. And then later, we also uh, 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 ask our uh, physiotherapy to help them restore uh, the shoulder uh, normal uh, kinematics, uh, kinematism. And uh, because in this case, uh, in many patients, the reason why they have impingement is because they do not uh, have uh, enough rotation of the scapula. And uh, because if they do not have enough uh, rotation of scapula, the subacromial space uh, will be uh, narrowed. And then you can visualize the subsequent uh, subacromial impingement syndrome. And uh, besides uh, uh, the dynamic test for subacromial impingement, Actually, there is another course of impingement and it happens at the anterior aspect of our shoulder. So this is our case uh, found uh, last year. The patient complained of uh, snapping when he tried to rest the shoulder. So we, when we examine uh, the, um, we use ultrasound to examine the shoulder and then we find uh, the patient has a thickened subacromial bursa. So when the patient uh, tried to uh, raise the shoulder, the second subacromial bursa is going to um, 
snap with uh, the coracoacromian ligament. And uh, that's why in this case, later we get uh, the subatelitoid injection uh, for the thickened bursa and the patient symptom improve a lot. So let's uh, see the video of uh, how the snapping happens. So this is the dynamic examination. So you see, uh, this is the relevant structure. So when the patient tries to rest the shoulder, you can find the snapping happened over here. So because in this view, we, we are not able to see uh, the coracal acromion ligament very well. So later we are going to use another view to uh, see uh, exactly uh, when uh, the snapping happens. So this is the coracal chromium ligament. So when a patient rests the shoulder, you are going to find the thickened bursa is going to um, push against the, the uh, acromion, ac acromion uh, clavicular ligament. And then that's how we diagnose uh, the exact course of the snapping. And uh, uh, for the injection, I think uh, in the past, uh, many doctors may overlook the importance of the problem in the long head of bicep tendon. But in my lifetime, actually, I spent lots of effort uh, in investigating the importance of the uh, bicep tendon especially the long head. We know the long head has a direct connection with the supra, uh, supraglenoic tubercle of, uh, uh, of the glenohumeral uh, joint. So that's why in patients with uh, shoulder pain, they may reflect some symptoms and the sign over the bicep tendon. So especially when the patient complain of anterior shoulder pain, you have to consider they have uh, some problem of the bicep tendon. So uh, if you want to inject the bicep tendon, uh, there are many ways. Uh, in this uh, uh, slide, we uh, demonstrate uh, the implant approach from lateral to medial. But when you do the injection, you have to be very cautious because uh, at the lateral aspect of the bicep tendon, there is the artery, we call it, um, uh, ascending branch of uh, the anterior humerus circumflex artery. And uh, if you do not turn on the power Doppler, you may misrecognize it as a part of the effusion. So very important thing is before you do the injection, uh, you need to turn on the Doppler to make sure where uh, the uh, artery is and then you insert the needle to uh, the peritendinous area. And uh, uh, this is how we perform uh, the injection. This is a bicep tendon. You can see uh, the tendon is uh, swollen and the there is uh, some effusion, some uh, hypertrophic synovia inside uh, this area. And then you insert your needle from lateral to medial and avoid, uh, not, avoid not hitting, avoid hitting uh, the, uh, artery besides the bicep tendon, and then you can perform this injection successfully. And the, another one is the acromion clavicular joint. And the, we know acromion clavicular joints play an uh, important role in stability of the shoulder joint. So once uh, there is instability uh, originating from this area, you can see many patients with uh, subsequent uh, subacromion impingement. So you can use either, uh, if in acute stage, you need to decrease the inflammation, you can use steroid hole injection. And in the chronic stage, you may consider to use regener regenerative injections to stabilize the joint uh, and the, the ligament on top of it. And uh, how are we going to perform the injection? Uh, there are several ways. You can use autoprene or use implant and then in this uh, slide, we use implant approach from lateral to media. From lateral to media, uh, the approach from lateral to media is easier because uh, first is more ergonomic. And the second is uh, usually the level of the acromion is usually lower than clavicle. So it's 
uh, gives you a, a, a space for you to insert your needle. So I think it's an easier way for new uh, for beginners. So this is how we perform the injection. Okay, first you recognize the clavicle, you recognize the chromium and the land. You can do the injection from either way. Yeah, but uh, uh, if, uh, so in this uh, picture, I use the media to later approach. Yeah, but I don't know why I did, I, I did that at that time. But I, as, as long as you can insert your needle into the joint capsule, it will be fine. And the another is a subdeltoid bursa. And uh, just like what I mentioned before, subdeltoid bursa is so important because it can reduce the friction force between the uh, acromion and uh, the uh, tendon inside the subacromion space. So in patients with uh, subacromion impingement, subdeltoid bursa injection is considered the standard way. So in this case, we put our transducer to see the uh, short axis of the subaspinatus tendon, and then we insert our needle from lateral to medial to uh, let the needle inside the subdeltoid bursa to distribute the medication. And uh, of course, we can do injection, we can do aspiration because uh, if there is lots of effusion inside the subdeltoid uh, place, the patient is going to feel very swollen. Uh, distension over their shoulder joint. So it's very important to aspirate the fluid out to improve the symptom. And of course, we can use uh, ultrasound uh, as a way uh, for, uh, I mean, injection as a way for treatment and also diagnosis. For this case, there is a gap over here, but if you don't use uh, uh, Injection, you don't know actually the patient has a partial tear at the bursa site. So that's why we can do the injection for diagnosis and for the treatment as well. And uh, uh, because uh, subacromian injection is a very common and important technique for a shoulder joint. So in 2017, we are uh, <laughs> curious about uh, is there any uh, sonograph sign can help us to uh, predict uh, the successfulness of uh, the subacromian uh, injection, ultrasound guided subacromian subdeltoid injection. So uh, we conduct a retrospective cohort study including more than 100 patients. In our study, we identified uh, several important uh, prognostic factors. So the good prognostic factor included uh, uh, the patient uh, is right handedness, the patient have grade to subacromic impingement, and the patient um, have uh, patient have uh, bicep group tenderness. So all the three signs indicate uh, the pain <coughs> of the uh, patients may come from either overuse and uh, instability uh, of uh, the subacromian space. So that's why the patient can uh, respond to subacromian injection quite well. And then there are several poor, poor prognostic factors, including subdeltoid bursitis, great uh, stress subacromian impingement, and the shoulder stiffness. Regarding the first one, so it indicates if you find that the subacromian bursa is thickened, uh, the patient may um, may, uh, may may suffer from the subacromian impingement for quite a long time. So instead, uh, besides uh, decrease uh, the inflammation or decrease the thickness of subdeltoid bursa, you have to consider to add some exercise treatment for the patient to, uh, re to let them restore uh, normal shoulder kinet kinetism. And uh, for uh, the second and the third factor, uh, grassroots subacromial impingement and <coughs> shoulder stability all indicate that the patient have a, a presentation like frozen shoulder. It means uh, their problem has extended to the granohumeral joint. So if you only uh, treat uh, the problem of uh, the subdeltoid bursa, it, it may not be enough to cure 
all the problems. And another important finding is, <clears throat> in some cases, uh, the patient come to your clinic and then they receive subchromine subdental injection and then they respond to the injection very well as the first time. But if they have a subdoyter bursa thickening, some of them may recur uh, earlier than other patients. And according to our study, the um, middle interval of recurrence is around four months. So that means in, if you, the patient come to your clinic and uh, you find that the subdeltoid bursa is thickened, the patient may come back to your clinic and ask you for another injection uh, four months later. So uh, just like I mentioned before, in some patients, even they have a symptom with a shoulder impingement syndrome, actually their pathology has already involved uh, the granular humeral joint. And in some patients with early frozen shoulder, we don't know whether the patient is true shoulder impingement or actually they, have already, they already have the component of the uh, second granular humeral joint capsule or uh, the adhesive capsulitis. So uh, in 2019, we developed a randomized control trial. Uh, we want to compare the standard uh, subacromic impingement uh, injection, corticosteroid injection, compared with that dual target subacromic corticosteroid injection. So you might be curious, what is the dual target subacromic corticosteroid injection? So uh, we know uh, bicep tendon has a direct connection with the granular humor joint. So if you insert your needle at the rotator cuff interval, there will be greater chance to let your injectate uh, flow back to the granular humeral joint. So through this window, you can inject the uh, bicep tendon sheets and also the subdeltoid bursa. So the, fruit, so the injecta inside the, the bicep tendon sheets will have the uh, opportunity to flow back to the granular humeral joint. So that's why we call this uh, technique dual target injection. So in patients, we, uh, so we, con we compare the standardized, standard uh, subdeltoid injection with uh, this dual target injection. In patients with uh, standard uh, subdeltoid injection, they on we only inject into the subdeltoid bursa. So in our study, we find at one month after injection, both group has a similar uh, pain improve improvement. But at the third month, we can find in the group with after uh, following dual target injection, there are fewer recurrence. So through this picture, we know uh, there must be some patients. The reason why they have shoulder pain is because they have some problem in, inside the granular humeral joint. Although in the, in the beginning, the improvement may get from the problem at, at the, uh, due to the improvement of the subacromy impingement. But if they still have some problem of the granular humeral joint, they may still have, they will have a recurrence. But if you use the dual target injection, you are going to improve both and decrease uh, the rate of the recurrence. And for patients with, <coughs> with shoulder pain, another common technique we usually use is the posterior granular humeral injection. Uh, in this case, you can see we insert our needle <coughs> into the posterior granular humeral capsule. You can insert from uh, middle to lateral or lateral to medial, as long as you know your target is inside the joint capsule. So this is uh, how we perform the injection. And uh, uh, in many patients, uh, you are going to know uh, the posterior granular humeral joint is located quite deep. So uh, if you want to do the injection, you can use the curve transducer to help uh, <coughs> you to visualize where the uh, posterior granular humeral joint is, and then you can do the injection easily. 
But uh, in patients with uh, frozen shoulder, we know uh, their shoulder joints may be adhesive, and then the adhesion may make the granular humor joint uh, not, you know, uh, not uh, connect to each other. For example, the anterior part of the granular humor joints may uh, may do may not uh, directly connected to the posterior part due to adhesion. So in that time, we need to we need to uh, selectively dilate the granular humeral joint. So that's why sometimes we have to do uh, the anterior granular humeral joint injection or dilatation. So how are we going to do it? We usually use uh, you can use the implant approach or auto plan approach. But personally, I prefer auto plan approach because it's easier. So we put a transducer distal to the coracoid process between the um, uh, between the scapula and the, the uh, humeral head, and then we can visualize the anterior granular humeral joint. And then once you locate the joint, you can uh, insert our needle uh, from caudal to cranial to target the joint space. So you can see this is a coracoid process. This is a humeral head. This is a subscapularis tendon. And then this is a joint space over here. So in this case, we use curved transducer because we know the anterior granular humeral joint is located very deep. And then we insert our needle uh, from uh, caudal to cranial to target this area. So once your needle um, uh, enter the joint space, you can start to push your injector to inject or dilate the joint space. And uh, another is uh, in some cases, uh, you find that they have deep cord to AB duct the shoulder, you may consider to perform the hydrodilatation of the superior granular humeral joint. So uh, how are we going to visualize it? We put our transducer uh, medial to the acromion, and then you can clearly visualize the superior granular humeral joint. But usually uh, the joint is hindered by the acromion. So we need to use uh, the curb transducer to help us visualize the joint space. Because use curb transducer, the side beam of, uh, of the ultrasound uh, is going to help you to visualize parts of the uh, superior labrum and also part of the humeral head. And then you can insert your needle just like you perform the suprascapular nerve block. Once your needle passes the joint capsule, you can do the injection. And the, what is the effect of the hydrodilatation for the granular humeral joints? This is uh, the picture before injection, and the, the picture at the right side is the picture after injection. So you know, after injection, you can find uh, the joint capsule is distended. So in this uh, systemic review and the meta-analysis, we are interested about what is the effect of the capsular distension. So in our uh, study, we find um, uh, compared with uh, steroid injection, uh, if you add uh, granular humeral joint hydrodilatation, you are going to expect there's no difference in shoulder function uh, in short term, but it's going to lead early improvement of the shoulder range of motion, especially external rotation. But in the long term, there is no difference. So it means if the patient come to your clinic and uh, they are uh, designing for early improvement of the limitation of shoulder joint. You can try to use a uh, granular humor joint hydrodilatation to improve their symptom. And the uh, another thing is in patients with shoulder pain, we know uh, 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 most of them uh, in, uh, in the long term, most of them may suffer from the impingement of the uh, suprascapular nerve over uh, some neuropath, neuropathic pain from the suprascapular nerve. So in our study, we, also, we are also interested in what is the effect of the suprascapular nerve block in patients with chronic shoulder pain. 
So this is the suprascapular nerve, and then we insert our needle. This is the standardized way to perform the suprascapular nerve block, and then we target the suprascapular nerve at the supra, uh, suprascapular fossa. And then this is how we perform it. This is the video demonstrate how we perform it to perform the suprascapular nerve block. We plug the nerve at the bottom of the supraspinatus borsa. So this is the effect of the suprascapular nerve block. In patients with chronic shoulder pain, its effect is better than physical therapy, better than placebo injection, and its effect is similar to intraarticular injection. So it means if your patient has some, for example, some contraindication for intraarticular corticosteroid injection, you may consider to use uh, uh, suprascapular nerve block to decrease their pain. And another thing is if you are an uh, anesthesiologist, uh, you may encounter many patients complain of shoulder pain after uh, shoulder surgery. So in this meta-analysis, we want to investigate whether uh, suprascapular nerve is, uh, is uh, beneficial for, for patients after uh, uh, suffer, first suffering from post-operative shoulder pain after shoulder surgery. And we find use uh, suprascapular nerve blood, it can um, decrease the pain in patient receiving uh, shoulder surgery. And it can also uh, decrease the side effects like nausea and the momentum after uh, due to overuse of the opioid after uh, the shoulder surgery. So if you are uh, an anesthesiologist and uh, if the, your patient needs uh, shoulder surgery, you may consider to give the patient a suprascapular nerve before the surgery to decrease the post-operative shoulder pain. And uh, uh, actually uh, we know the uh, Suprascapular nerve is the branch of the superior trunk of the uh, brachial plexus. So in 2016, we write an article elaborating uh, the technique of uh, scanning uh, the uh, nerve over the cervical region. And uh, then uh, if you want to track the suprascapular nerve at uh, uh, the very proximal region, you can first you locate the superior trunk and then you can find uh, the suprascapular nerve actually besides the, beside the superior trunk and underneath the omohyoid muscle. And then we also uh, use uh, the, uh, the technique, proximal suprascapular nerve block on patients with uh, a case, case trend, uh, shoulder pain due to malignance. Because in patients with malignancy, some of them are very weak. They cannot uh, sit upright to receive the standard uh, ultrasound guided suprascapular nerve, nerve block. So in this case, we apply this technique uh, to uh, block the proximal suprascapular nerve uh, in seven patients. And then we find uh, the result is uh, fantastic. Most of patients get uh, more than 50% of pain relief after this procedure. But another important thing is uh, we know uh, shoulder joint is innervated by uh, many nerves. And the axial nerve is considered the second important nerve of our shoulder joint. So uh, in 2017, uh, we are interested because in the past, when we uh, inject the axial nerve, we usually inject from the posterior aspect, targeting the nerve at the quadrilateral space. But we know uh, for patients with uh, axial nerve entrainment neuropathy, some of them may have uh, entrainment uh, at uh, the area just, uh, uh, just over the uh, inferior acida area. So that's why we develop a technique, we call it inferior acida technique to uh, inject the nerve at the proximal origin. So this is how we identify the nerve. First, we have to let patients abduct shoulder like this, and then you can recognize several muscles. And then the biggest muscle you can recognize is the TS major. 
And then if you move your transducer up and down, you can find the TS major much with the lattice mass dorsi to become the conjoint tender. And the, when you move your transducer up and down, you can find some structure coarse through this area underneath the TS major. One is the posterior humerus circumference artery, the other is the anterior nerve. So when you identify the posterior circumference artery, you move your transducer slightly up or slightly down, you can see an hypoechoic structure underneath the TS major. This is the SL nerve. And then you can do the injection. This is how we do the injection. So first, we have to identify uh, which muscle we are scanning. So when you open the SLR, the biggest muscle you can see is the TS major. So you see, this is a TS major, this is latissimus dorsi. Once you move your transducer cranially, you can find that the muscle becomes smaller and smaller, and then they will merge with the tendon from the latissimus dorsi to become a conjoint tendon. And then later, you can scan uh, the uh, posterior humor circumference artery. So you can turn on a Doppler, you can find the posterior circumference artery wrap around the humeral head and then uh, link back to the subclavian artery. And then once you see the artery, you are going to know the nerve is, is not far away. So you can look for the hypoechoic structure on top of the uh, cortex of the humerus. This is the axillary nerve. So you can track the SL nerve uh, until it um, exits the quadrilateral space. So once you see it, you can uh, do the injection. Uh, you can do the injection uh, from lateral to medial. So your needle is going to uh, pierce the TS major muscle and then you can target the nerve and the, do uh, the nerve hydrodization. So this is how we perform the injection over the infra area. Okay, so if you are interested in uh, my talk, especially the talk regarding the ultrasound guided injection, you can refer to our article published in 2017. In this article, like our serial publication, we incorporate uh, uh, many cadaveric pictures to show uh, the uh, anatomy of the joint of, of area you are going to intervene and also it's in, we also include some video for you if you want to learn by yourself. So thank you and uh, you know uh, if you are interested in my talk and if you are interested in muscular skeletal ultrasound you are welcome to join uh, MSK ultrasound uh, club uh, on Facebook and of course uh, you know remember uh, one day if the pandemic is resolved, you are welcome to visit Taiwan again to join our activity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. That was yes. really very Thank awesome you. lecture. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, a different an approach that you have introduced to us. Yes. And, uh, I think uh, with all the papers that you have published, I only can say that uh, these are really real and actual uh, procedures that uh, we can always look back to. And yeah, to and, the, and the, the procedure are practical, yeah, very practical. Yeah. Mm. So uh, for those of you who are very interested in, in going back to what Kevin has lectured, you can always uh, go back to his uh, papers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, whatever he's saying. Of course, he's, he's the real Kevin, by the way. He's the real Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kevin, yeah, yeah. Hope we can meet face by face, you know. Uh, Everything is resolved. Yeah. You know, yeah we, that, we really missed all day. <laughs> yeah. So there's one question here, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, it's about uh, from Johnson Lee. Johnson Lee, if you're around, you can ask the Dr. Kevin directly. Yeah, if you yeah, want. Yeah. <clears throat> Please. Okay. You can, uh, uh, Johnson, are you here? Can you hear me? Maybe he's not answering. Maybe he's uh, doing something. Okay, let me just read this question. 
I would like to ask about suprascapular nerve block. How do you manage to block a mixed sensory motor nerve without reducing the function? Thank Can you repeat? Because uh, there is some noise uh, besides me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The question is, uh, it's about the suprascapular nerve block. Yes. And so he's asking, it's a mixed sensory and motor nerve. So mm. uh, when you block it, is it, is it not affecting oh. the function of the nerve because it's a mixed sensory and motor? So that's the question. Yes, uh, I think it's a very great question. Uh, in patients, uh, usually um, for patients uh, with a full suprascapular block, we, some of doctors are going to use a large volume. But nowadays, uh, if uh, we use ultrasound guidance, we can decrease the volume. For example, five milliliter of local anesthetics. In the past, some of that may use 20 uh, milliliter. So of course, large value is going to uh, cause uh, more motor and the sensory block. And I think uh, what we concern most is the motor block because the sensory block is the, the result we want because we want to decrease the pain. So um, there are some ways to, uh, I, I think if you use a uh, local anesthetic uh, because uh, the uh, effect of the block uh, may fade. So that's why we actually we are not uh, not uh, worry about uh, the motor block. If, you know, uh, we know uh, the effect will uh, disappear later. But if you use a <coughs> radio frequency operation, you have to consider something. Uh, because, um, uh, for example, uh, we know uh, the uh, suprascapular nerve innervate the supraspinatus muscle and the infraspinatus muscle. And the supraspinatus muscle is, of course, uh, more important. So if you want to perform the radial frequency operation, the motor uh, branch to innervate the suprascapular uh, nerve is usually at uh, near the suprascapular notch. So uh, I remember uh, last year, we, I, I went to Philippines to uh, have a conference with uh, Professor Philip Penn. Uh, he mentioned that if you want to perform the radio frequency operation, uh, you can target uh, the suprascapular nerve at the middle portion uh, in, at, uh, in the supraspinatus uh, fossa. Because if you target the middle portion, you are uh, you can avoid uh, damaging uh, the, uh, uh, the the motor branch innervated innervating uh, the supraspinatus uh, supraspinatus muscle. But uh, uh, if uh, you know you just use block, uh, my suggestion is you use a small volume. It will be fine and also effective. Kevin, for answering that question, there's another one here. Uh is asking about the what anesthetic agent on how much volume do you use for nerve block? Oh, okay. <clears throat> I'm not an anesthesiologist. So in my clinic, we do not have my time or long acting, uh, long acting local anesthetic. So I think uh, for pain, you know, uh, not for post operative shoulder pain, just uh, for shoulder pain, chronic shoulder pain, you can try use light open. And then, you know, the lidocaine, actually, the duration is very short. But uh, <clears throat> very interestingly, even, uh, you know, uh, when if allow uh, the duration of uh, the lidocaine is very short, but it, it can achieve very good results. Mm -hmm. So I think it's because when we perform the suprascapular nerve block, we have already uh, block some visual cycle. So the patient may feel less pain and the patient may gradually return to their normal uh, shoulder activity. So once their normal uh, shoulder activity or normal shoulder kinetism is uh, recovered, they are going to feel less pain. So I, I think if you, you, your pain clinic is, if you run a, a pain clinic and the patient, you know, the, you are not going to admit the patient, I suggest to use short acting local anesthetic because it's safer. Because you know, if the patient complain of severe weakness after the injection, you, you can tell the patient, okay, 
uh, you are going to recover, you know, half an hour late. So don't worry. So I think it's safer and also effective based on my clinical experience. Okay, any, any follow-up uh, question to that uh, answer of Dr. Kevin? Okay, uh, you know, a very interesting thing is, uh, uh, in some severe patients, they need uh, several times of uh, suprascapular block. But if the patient just develop a pain and then, for example, the patient complain of pain due to calcified tendinitis, because you do the suprascapular block to decrease the acute pain. And uh, you also add some, for example, add some <coughs> um, uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory agent to improve <coughs> improve uh, the symptom of uh, the case by tendinitis. So actually, uh, one week later, the patient can have pain free because you already uh, you already do two things. One is for uh, decrease the pain. The other is to treat the underlying pathology. Okay, there are two more questions, uh, Kevin. The first one is uh, for short-acting lidocaine. How long will the effect last? Okay, uh, you know, um, according to some paper, let's say that the <coughs> the maximum duration is uh, not longer than two or three uh, three uh, hours, but um, very. Uh, very interestingly, although the actin is very short, uh, because uh, we usually use uh, you know five to ten milliliter to do the injection, so uh, you can consider it's a uh, um, large volume for it's a volume for hydro uh, dilatation. So we find many patients after the injection, the effect can last longer than you expect. Some of them may that may last uh, for uh, two weeks and even for one month. It's quite surprising, but uh, we, we think because you use large volume for uh, injection. So if the nerve is adhesed at that moment, the adhesion can be improved by the by injection of large volume. Yeah. Uh, you have to turn, turn on your uh, microphone, I cannot hear you. Okay, the other question is, how much fluid for hydrodilation of capsule oh, okay. do you use? So, so, so it's a very interesting question. Uh, if you look at the study, you are going to find uh, many study use uh, 20 milliliter and uh, some study use 10, millimeter, 10, 10 milliliter. And according to my experience and also in my study, we use around 10 millimeter. 10 milliliter. Because in the past, if you look at literature, you can find uh, some of them either use uh, the uh, fluoroscopy or use uh, uh, blind injection. <clears throat> and I, I think in patients uh, who receive blind injection, most of, of the injecta uh, is probably not inside the granular humeral joint. If you precisely place uh, your needle inside the granular humeral joint, and in patients with uh, frozen shoulder, you will have very difficulty to, to inject because of the, the resistance is very, very high. So uh, for me, I, I think uh, 10 milliliter is the maxima for a patient with a severe uh, frozen shoulder. And the, another thing I have to emphasize is uh, when you perform the hydrodilatation of uh, the shoulder, remember to add steroid. And uh, we find that if you do not add steroids, the hydrodilatation will not be uh, effect. Because you know when you do the uh, hydrodilatation, it's like mechanically stretch uh, the, the granular humor capsule, it's going to cause damage. So you need to use steroid to decrease the inflammation to prevent it to uh, adhesive again. So, so that's why uh, if you want to perform the uh, granular humoral hydrodilatation, remember to add steroid. Yes. So I think uh, uh, Kevin has uh, answered your question correctly, all of you. So uh, we thank you, Dr. Kevin, for this uh, very comprehensive 
and very enlightening information that you have shared to us. It's really a great lecture. And we thank you for spending your time with us. I know you're very busy. Yes. It's very thank hard you. to get your schedule. So, but still you find time to share with us your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, take care in Taiwan. Yes. And take regards care. to our friends. Yes. Bye-bye. Uh, and uh, don't forget, uh, if everything will be okay, you'll be coming to the Philippines next year. Yeah, of course, of course. With, uh, I'm Dr. looking Jacobson. forward. Yeah, with Dr. John Jacobson. So we yes. thank everyone for... Uh, oh, there's somebody who's raising his hand. Asmi, is that you? Asmi, do you have a question? There's a question here. Uh, is that okay, Kevin? Okay, okay, please, please. It's about cancer pain. Okay, go ahead, Asmi. Oh, okay. The, anyway, the question was uh, typed here. It was... It, for cancer pain in inferior part of the shoulder or axillary part, which nerve you will select to block? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, if you are targeting uh, the pain over the inferior, uh, in, uh, inferior part of the shoulder, I think you need to target the axillary nerve. But uh, another important thing is uh, you have to look for uh, the uh, pathology of the shoulder. For example, if the metastatic metastatic area is at the lateral part, probably you use the traditional way to perform the SL nerve block is enough. But if you find actually uh, the reason why the patient have pain is because uh, the uh, metastatic lesion uh, is uh, found at uh, uh, the inferior part of uh, the humeral head. You need to use the, the proximal uh, SL nerve block to decrease the pain because uh, if you use uh, the distal approach, you are not going to cover the painful area. Okay, I think that uh, very much covered that uh, area. And uh, I really appreciate you for, uh, for attending and coming. And thank you again, Kevin, for yes. a very nice lecture. And regards to all our friends in Taiwan. And hope to see you soon when everything okay. is uh, okay. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you very much. God bless.